national conference when it was down in South Florida. And um, I had the first book I ever published was through University of Florida Press. And it was a um, how to garden for wildlife in South Florida, particularly looking at birds. Um, and I was there with a booth that had my photography and the editor that had helped us work on that book came over and said, you know, we'd really like to publish more of your photographs. So why don't you pitch us an idea? And so I thought about it a little bit. I did some research and it didn't take long to realize there really wasn't a good comprehensive book on Florida's wildlife. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll do that. And um, I thought it was going to be relatively easy. I had been working as a biologist in South Florida for almost 20 years. I'd been taking photos for, you know, 10 or so by then and maybe even more. And I was like, yeah, this is no problem. I probably got everything I need anyway. Um, and this is five years later. I thought at the time, oh, I'll just take one year to do it. No big deal. So obviously it was a little more complicated that, than that. Um, it turns out I didn't know Central and North Florida nearly as well as I thought I did. Um, and also, you know, some of these animals that are really wary and endangered are recovering enough that I could get them in the wild, but it took a lot of time and effort. And so I spent in the last five years, I've spent many, many, many hours hiking miles in the woods and also sitting in my Jeep, using it as a, a mobile blind to try and take pictures of some of these animals. And in the end, it really gave me a whole new appreciation for Florida and its nature. And um, hopefully I'll pass that on to you as we go along tonight. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's not that Florida's nature is underappreciated or unappreciated. I think it's just that there's a little slice that people think about when they think of Florida. And especially people from coming from out of the state, they think, oh, yeah, Florida's all about alligators. And of course, we do have alligators. And people come because they want to see the manatees. And, you know, that also is something very cool and special and worth coming to see. Um, I would say the thing that probably put Florida's nature on the map in the first place were the birds, the wading birds. And that was at a time when plumes were all the rage and the fashion industry uh, was fueling all of these rookeries being shot out. And that was really the time when people started recognizing how rich our bird life was at the very least. And, um, and and it became kind of the heart of a conservation movement, which fortunately in the end rallied and we now still have many, many waiting birds in Florida. So this was kind of the, the start of all of it. And this is kind of people's perception even now of what Florida is, but it turns out Florida has a whole lot more to offer than that. Um, and if you look at this map, you can see those red areas indicate biodiversity hotspots. And those are areas within all of North America that are considered really rich for their biodiversity. And we're gonna take a deeper look at each of those and what those are. So that first one up in the panhandle is an area of temperate biodiversity. Some of the highest number of turtles, reptiles, amphibians, um, even plant species occur in that area. Uh, for the land mass. So really high numbers of temperate diversity, which in a state that people mostly think of as, as tropical is pretty surprising. Um, and that's because that part of the state stayed connected to North America at times when sea levels were rising and other parts of Florida were underwater. So that stayed connected to the temperate zone throughout. And even today, it's still directly connected to the Appalachian Mountains through the Apalachicola River. And so the Appalachian Mountains have the highest diversity of salamanders in, in the world, actually. And it's not a surprise then to learn that the Panhandle also has a high diversity of salamanders. And in fact, nearly all of the salamander species in Florida, not entirely, but most of them only occur in the Panhandle and northernmost Florida. So to me, this was exciting. I originally, when I went, went to school, graduate school to study biology, I wanted to study salamanders. So um, it's always exciting to me to get to go to the panhandle and actually see salamanders. Don't have very many down here in, uh, in Miami area where I live. The other thing that they have a lot of are pitcher plants. It's one of the best places to see pitcher plants. And these are carnivorous plants. Uh, they live in wetlands, flooded wetlands within pine forests. 
Um, and because these plants eat insects, they have all kinds of ways of attracting insects so that they can eat them. But they also are hosting a whole other population of insects that are there to also eat those insects. So what you see there on that pitcher plant is a, a green link spider. Um, which again is there specifically to help take advantage of all of the insects that are being attacked, attracted to these pitcher plants. And they're just really very kind of Alice in Wonderland plants. So I, they appeal to me for that reason. Um, but one of the other things I learned while I was in the panhandle is that a black water riverbed, even when it looks like on the map is a road is not necessarily. Um, and even in the dry season, it looked dry, but as soon as I got my Jeep in there, I started sinking and I tried calling a million tow companies and all of them were like, uh-uh, you're where? No, we're not coming there. Um, so I had to get the sheriff's office to come tell me out. So there were certainly some more adventures than I would have liked to have in the making of this book. <laughs> um, the other thing that was a surprise to a lot of South Floridians was that I was going up to the panhandle to take pictures of beavers. And people were like, beavers? Florida has beavers? That's crazy. And my dad, he grew up in Colorado. He thinks of it as an animal that is associated with mountain streams. Um, and to some extent, you know, the idea that Florida doesn't have um, beavers is correct because in South Florida, they never got this far south. But also, it turns out beavers used to be the major engineers of our waterways all across North America. So they were far more widespread than perception today, but they've been really uh, pushed back into li more limited ranges because most people don't like having a big dam on their property or having their trees cut down. But in the Panhandle, I, I went to Tallahassee and some of the city parks, and it didn't take long for people to tell me exactly which parks had beaver lodges. So it's just a normal part of life in the Panhandle and northernmost Florida. Um, and in Blackwater River State Forest, I saw some of the biggest uh, beaver dams I've ever seen, big series of them, multi-generational dams. Um, and that one you can see in the picture there, it's hard to tell from that photo. But in fact, that bank was right up against the road and it was built up all the way to the window of my Jeep. So these are very, very impressive beaver dams. Um, and these are very impressive animals in their capacity to do that. And this is another animal that only gets into northernmost Florida, a little bit into central Florida. Um, this is an eastern fence lizard. And they are pretty widespread across North America. They're all the way from the Midwest to the Northeast, all the way down South. Uh, but again, very limited range within Florida. But the reason I want you to see this particular lizard is because it's a good indication of how our next biodiversity hotspot worked and, and how it exists. So take a look, good look at this guy. And now meet the Florida scrub lizard. Now, it's not an accident that they look similar. The Florida scrub lizard actually came from the eastern fence lizard. And what happened is over time, remember I said the sea levels were high, that second set of biodiversity red down the center of the state is an area of highlands um, that was underwater, I mean, that remained an island while the rest of the peninsula was, um, was flooded at certain times. And so, these lizards got separated from the eastern fence lizard and the eastern fence lizard maintained the way the rest of North America had their fence lizard, but ours adapted to what at the time was a big sand dune, essentially. And so our sand scrub in central Florida is a habitat that is essentially beach derived and is unique in it's only found in Florida, our Florida scrub. And there are a lot of endemic species that evolved along with that habitat at these times where it was isolated from the rest of North America. So things like this Florida scrub lizard, our Florida scrub jay, uh, related to the ones out west, but so far removed that it's now our only full-blown species that's endemic to Florida. And in fact, their, their biology is very, very different than scrub jays anywhere else. Um, it's a very close knit family group. Um, the young will stay on and help their siblings, raise their siblings until there's another territory nearby that they can move into. Um, and they really defend their territories as a family. So I had many opportunities that I was walking through the scrub and I'd have this whole family there yelling down at me 
And what's cool is their vocalizations are very nuanced and they're telling each other, you know, this is a predator, it's an air predator, it's a land predator, it's a snake. They can tell that kind of detail in those calls, which is pretty impressive. And this, you've heard of the black widow spider. Well, on this scrub area, we have the red widow spider. And, you know, I learned about this kind of late as I was working on the project. And as soon as I heard about it and saw pictures, I was like, I have to have this in my book. I've got to find this. So I did a lot of research. Where would I find it? And everything said, you know, you're going to have to find it in the winter, in the fog, when there's dew drops on the, on the uh, webs, and you're going to be looking for this in a covering palm meadows. Well, at that point, it was June. Um, my book deadline was in the fall, so I wasn't going to get another win winter to try. And I just happened to be next to a nice patch of scrub on a, a foggy morning. And I thought, well, I mean, it's at least overcast, so let's just give it a try. And I had no expectation that I was going to succeed at this, but I was going to try anyway. And um, sure enough, I finally figured out the the right look of the web. It was covering the plants, but it wasn't even on palmettos. It was on oaks. Um, but but I knew what I was looking for was these massive webs that went down to a little funnel. And so when I finally saw one that went down to a little funnel, I peeked in there and this mom that was protecting her egg case in there came tearing out at me. And I was like, whoa, okay, success. Um, but it did startle me a little bit. They are venomous, although like most spiders, uh, they can't bite us. It's very hard for them to bite us. Not that they can't, but it would be very challenging. You'd have to really, really be messing with them for that to happen. Um, but nonetheless, she was a mother defending her eggs. So worth giving her a little bit of space. But it ended up being a really good day. I saw so many of these spiders and they truly, are, they look like gems. Um, they're just so pretty. Oh, and actually, can I go back? Let's see. Yeah, what this uh, spider is wrapping up right there is a palmetto scarab beetle that is also endemic to that habitat. And here we have the Florida grasshopper sparrow. This is one of our most endangered birds. It's um, a subspecies, not a species. So, you know, you might be during migration and in the winter, you may see grasshopper sparrows that have come down from up north. But this is our native subspecies. Um, and it requires a different uh, highland, central highland habitat, which is our dry prairie. Um, and they don't move. They're there all year round. Uh, they nest on the ground. So they're highly susceptible to all kinds of uh, predators and alterations. Habitat loss has been a big thing for them. Um, and I was quite honored to be able to go out to find this population, which was a brand new population that they had just discovered. And one of the things I thought was really cool about it was they had discovered it on a ranch. So, you know, the nice thing about this is that there can be situations where dry prairie and branching or agriculture are, are working together. It's not one or the other. We can have both these endangered birds and a working landscape. Um, and that's the type of coexistence that we really need um, moving forward. And that last biodiversity hotspot in the Southeast um, is for tropical species. And it makes sense because it is right across the water from Cuba and the Bahamas in the warm waters. We share a lot of their plants and we have a lot of animals as well that came from that area, um, mostly flying, um, but some also swimming. And of course, some also probably rafting, especially during storms. So reptiles could have come over amphibians on logs, for example, um, during big storm events. And so we have a lot of species that, especially with, if you consider North America in general, we have a whole lot of tropical species that occur nowhere else in North America. That ligueous snail is one example. And in fact, that ligueous snail only occurs in South Florida and Cuba, nowhere else. Um, and they're known as the gems of the snails and we're quite popular with collectors. That's just one pattern there, but there's hundreds of patterns uh, that can be found. And during the period of really heavy collection, um, you know, different hammocks may have their own pattern of snail shell. And so collectors would go and they'd take as many as they could and then they'd burn down the hammock in the hope of having the only of that kind of pattern. Um, fortunately, uh, early in the days of Everglades National Park, um, the this 
the some, an arranger recognized that these color forms were were declining and the patterns were declining. And so they went and collected a bunch of them and brought them into the park where they could be protected. So we still have a lot of different color forms in Florida today, um, in part because of that effort. And the Geiger beetle is one I love. It It is associated with the Geiger tree, um, which is this beautiful tropical tree with these orange flowers. And you find these little Geiger beetles on there and they just look like these little emeralds uh, sitting there. Um, and the color on there that they have in their uh, shell is, is based on liquid that moves through the cuticle. And so they're over shifting metallic little color and they're so beautiful um, as adults. But as larvae, they actually lift their tail above them like a par parasol almost, except this is one where they actually poop all over themselves to protect themselves from predators. So I much prefer the adult form myself. Um, and this is the Florida bonneted bat. It's a tropical bat that occurs only in Florida. Um, again, you know, we have central highlands endemics. We also have tropical endemics. And so, in fact, Florida is one of the top in the nation in terms of a numbers of endemic species um, for a state. Um, so this guy was considered to be really, really rare. Uh, but new technology has allowed uh, sonar acoustic uh, monitoring. And Zoo Miami partnered with Bat Conservation International, and they did countywide surveys here in Miami-Dade and realized that even in this really dense, one of the densest urban areas in the nation, we had Florida bonneted bats living all over. And so they put up a whole bunch of uh, bat houses to try and help them out because they, they run into problems when people try to change their roofs or, you know, Spanish tiles are going out of, out of fashion now. So again, that's something that harms the, the Florida bonneted bat. Um, but when I asked, you know, hey, and as soon as they put up the bat houses, they got filled. And so I contacted Zoo Miami and I said, I'd, I'd really like to come take pictures of your bats. I know your program has been really successful. And they said, well, good luck. They're really high. You won't see them. Uh, even if you have a super long lens, you're not going to see them. But um, you might hear them. And I was like, okay, but I need, I need a picture. And he was like, yeah, sorry, we can't help you. It's not going to work out. The very next day I get an email and he was like, you must be really lucky or something because there's one in a picnic pavilion right next to the zoo. So if you come over, we'll, we'll take a look at it. It turns out this was a young male. Um, and they had their breeding system is they work in harems. So a male will have a, a, a his group of women that he's tending um, and they stay together year round, but he can't always please all those females all the time. Uh, and so young males like this will try and camp out nearby to uh, get a little action on the side. And uh, I, I guess I hope he succeeded. And then, of course, by the time you get down into the Keys and particularly Dry Tortugas National Park, which is 70 miles um, west of Key West and about the same north of Cuba, you truly feel like you're in the Caribbean. You have these beautiful blue waters, white sand beaches, and you have species of birds that nest there that nest nowhere else uh, in in North the continental North America, uh, the United States at least. So we have sooty terns, which in fact are the reason the national park was even formed there. We have mass boobies, um, magnificent frigate birds. Uh, so there's many species that nest there and nowhere else. And these are tropical birds. And then, of course, it's also famous for spring migration because so many birds go through there. And a lot of them don't necessarily make it through Florida. Otherwise, they, they stop here. And of course, where you guys are, Orlando area, you have some really nice, extensive natural areas uh, that host animals like this bobcat. This was at Wakaira Springs, uh, where I met Kathy for the first time and Susan. Um, and so you have some of these really nice animals that are being maintained in those natural areas. But you also have the Lake Apopka restoration, which is one of the most incredible restoration areas um, and has been highly successful, turned that lake from something super polluted into this really incredibly rich area um, that is very good for water birds. Um, and also vagrants like the vermilion flycatcher. Fly um, now that guy I actually took a picture of at St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge and he's the one in the book. But while I was up in that area, I did get a beautiful picture of a female um, who's going in a different book. <laughs> so you have to wait for that book to see that picture. And of course, also in the Orlando area, you, you also have as many places in Florida have green iguanas. 
Um, and most of what I, I mean, all of what I had talked about earlier, those were all native species. Um, but we do also have non-native species. And the demarcation is what was introduced by people after Europeans arrived. And so green iguanas were one of those. And of course, we have at this point, many, many, many Florida tops both the nation and the world in terms of number of non-native species that are established in our state. Um, the thing about non-natives, oh, and in fact, at this point, actually, we have more non-native lizard species than we have native lizard species that live in Florida. Um, but the thing to keep in mind about non-natives is they're not all equal, right? There's an, there's this gut instinct, oh, they're all horrible. Um, but some of them aren't, you know, some of them have just stayed in a really localized area and, you know, they're probably having some impact there, but it's not hugely detrimental. Uh, this is a troop of vervet mon monkeys, for example, that escaped from a facility um, in Broward and live in the mangroves just outside the Fort Lauderdale airport. And they have been living there for decades and they frequent this car park right by the airport. And, you know, they've been there a long time and they haven't expanded their range and they're probably not having much of an impact. But we also have, as most of you know, the Burmese python. And in fact, it's even been recorded up in Merritt Island now. So it is here to stay and it is continuing to spread. Um, and part of the reason it has been so effective at really taking over is because it is from a wetlands like the Everglades, and it has evolved with that. Meanwhile, I just finished this book last year for Everglades National Park um, 75th anniversary. And one of the things that I became aware of was the fact that the Everglades is only 5,000 years old. We had people here 10,000 years, and we had all kinds of wildlife here before the Everglades was ever formed. So a lot of our native animals were not actually particularly well adapted to the Everglades, not when you compare it to a python that has always lived in that habitat. And so these guys came in and they were probably better suited for the Everglades than a lot of our native species. And they've been able to thrive um, and unfortunately have been very detrimental, wiped out mammal populations, are moving on to birds. Um, and that's all very scary. And one of the things uh, that was really shocking to me during this project, I knew it was going to be hard to find them because I have friends who research pythons and they consistently tell me, you know, I almost step on them when I'm radio tracking them. So I knew it was going to be hard, and I fortunately had the opportunity to go out um, as the artist in residence at Big Cypress National Preserve with their researchers, um, and they're trying to look at, well, what can we do to manage the populations out deep in the Everglades where it's hard, habitat is hard to get into, or, you know, most of the efforts are on levees and areas like that that, that can be driven. Um, and, but, you know, they're far and wide, and they're in inaccessible places. So this female that you see on the lower right, she was a record breaking female at the time. And they were storing her in a big box that had holes so that her pheromones or essentially her, her perfumes during mating, uh, when she was breeding, uh, would get released and attract males. And then they were catching all they were monitoring the area every day. And, and any male that they found, they would tag and then they kept going back and they were looking to see how long would they stay around? How far were they coming from? And the male is the one you see under the water on the left. Now that guy went out with a, a whole troop of people looking for it. It was, they were doing a, a show for a congressman's office. So there were about 20 people. Um, we could hear the dinging. We knew we were right on top of this python, but we couldn't see it. And it was really like that many of us. And we almost walked by this thing. And for 20 minutes, it, con it continued to just stay completely wrapped underneath this cypress tree under the water, didn't breathe or anything. That photo actually was after everybody else left and I stayed there quietly by myself for a while and it finally stuck its nose up just long enough to breathe and then went back under. So these are highly secretive, highly effective and rather terrifying um, predators. But the good news is as they, the longer that they're here, uh, our native wildlife is also starting to adjust to this new predator. And that often happens with new invaders, right? Initially, they have a, all the opportunity in the world and they have no enemies and they get really out of control. But eventually controls fit into place, biological controls. And so recently there's been some observations of bobcats, for example, raiding the nests of 
of mother pythons, even fighting the python to take those eggs. So hopefully we'll get a little bit more in balance there and hopefully they'll find new tools to help manage these guys as well. But the nice thing about Florida is it's blended, right? So we have natives and non-natives. We have tropical species and temperate species. We have our endemics. And it's not like you just go to one place and that's all there is there, right? Everything is mixed. So this is a picture from Blue Spring State Park. And in the morning, during the day, I was watching tropical manatees come into the water to warm up in the winter. And that very night, I went and saw temperate fireflies uh, in the forests above. So we have this wonderful mix. Um, and incidentally, it turns out Florida has the highest number of firefly species in the nation as well, which I was surprised to learn, but they're beautiful. Um, and I think the blending is going to continue as climate change is making animals move around. Um, this is the roseate spoonbill. They traditionally, historically, only nested in Florida Bay. That was where they've nested. But climate change and saltwater inundation, it's changing the conditions for them, and they're no longer able to feed their chicks there. So they've been moving northward. And this picture is actually from St. Augustine. So, you know, Conditions are changing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're losing those animals. They're just moving other places and they're dealing with it in their own way. And so the fact that we're blended and those things can happen is really nice. They are not going where there's no, no um, plants that they recognize, right? There's still some overlap. It may be slightly different composition, but they can still survive there. Um, and, and that's encouraging. And the other thing that's encouraging is that we have protected areas all across the state in order to make that happen and allow that to happen. Now on this map, you'll see those dark green areas are areas that protect that are protected. And overall, Florida is doing pretty well. About 30% of our land is in some sort of protection. Um, but the light green is areas that we hope sometime will be protected and are not yet. And I'll get back to that in a second. But what I really wanna show you right here is these two species are species that probably wouldn't be here without those reserves. Uh, crocodiles were hunted to near ex extirpation. Um, they would have, it's a Caribbean species, so there would have, they wouldn't have gone extinct. They would have still been in the Caribbean, but the Florida population was nearly gone. And it was only the intervention to make it, uh, put it on the Endangered Species Act, create land for it, um, and you know save these areas and really protect the animal is what allowed it to come back. And at the top there is an Everglades mink. And this is an animal that is so rare and endangered. It never even crossed my mind that I might have pictures of it. Um, but I was in a reserve early in the morning waiting for a panther. Um, I'd heard that this area was good for panthers. So I would go there many, many days in a row um, and just park my Jeep before sunrise and wait with all my windows down and wait and watch and hope it would come. And one morning while I was waiting and hoping for a panther that never showed, uh, I saw these little furry things tumbling across the, the path. And it turns out it was a family of Everglades mink. Um, and I was able to come back day after uh, several weeks in a row until finally one of them, much bigger at this point, um, paused on a log for me to get a clean shot. Before that, they were all blurry because they were always rustling and tumbling around or in the vegetation. But I'm pretty sure, you know, they wouldn't be there without that reserve. So reserves are incredibly important. Another animal that we wouldn't have today if it weren't for reserves are is the Florida panther. Um, and this was one that actually took even more than just creating reserves. They had to bring in Texas cougars to uh, bring back their genetics a little bit because they were starting, they were so inbred and so few of them left. Um, but their population is, is recovering now. And in fact, they need more space than they had before because the reserves are not enough for the number of panthers that we have now. Um, but, you know, when I first moved to Florida 20 years ago, the idea of anyone seeing a panther in the wild was just ridiculous. And in fact, when I started this project, I was like, oh, I'm just going to put in a picture of a panther in the zoo because nobody sees panthers. Um, and then I started doing the research and realized, no, they've recovered really well. And, and sometimes people even come home, people that live near these reserves to find a panther in their yard and they're expanding northward. They're all the way in central Florida now. So they're recovering. But you also recognize, I mean, for me anyway, I one of the things I realized was 
how much of an impact people have even in these reserves. And so that top picture of the mother with the cubs, that was after the stay at home order, uh, the pandemic. And that was a month of the animals having this park to themselves. And I had been going to this park many, many times looking for panthers and not had any luck. But this was the very first day that the stay at home order was lifted. And I went over and I saw this, this mom and her, there was actually three cubs. The other ones tumbled into the vegetation at this point, but they were just walking down there and it was early in the morning and it was clearly their time, their road. And, you know, I didn't want to get closer because I didn't want to bother them. I wanted them to have their time before people started coming back. So we have a pretty big impact even in these reserves. And so it shows you again, how important those reserves are to give them some space. And also, you know, 30%, is that enough? No, probably not. We need those light green areas on that first map I showed you to become dark green areas as well. We need those quarters and the Florida Wildlife Corridor Project uh, is aiming to try and fill those in. And it's really important because roads, you know, outers aren't the only thing being killed. Panthers, still the number one cause of mortality is roads. Um, so that's really, really important that we have those areas. Um, and, you know, it's not impossible. Bears turned out to be my nemesis animal in this whole project. And I took, when I first started, everyone was like, oh, you're going to see tons of them in Ocala. Don't you worry. And I spent a lot of time in Ocala and I spent a lot of time in a lot of places where I would see fresh tracks and I would think, oh, I'm on it. I'm going to get the bear. And I bought my first camo jacket and I've got, I tried cover sense that smelled terrible. And I was doing everything I could. It turns out they have an incredible sense of, of smell. And so I would maybe get a glimpse, but they'd be really far away and, and they're really quiet too. So these huge bears and you, you know, you don't even hear them. Um, and the place that I ultimately was able to get pictures of them was in the Golden Gate Estates, which is right by a whole bunch of reserves in out, outside of Naples. Um, and in that particular area, um, the Pineland is still interspersed with the development. It's unfortunately that's changing, but at that, when I was there, people still had Pineland in their yard and Pineland between the houses. And that was where I was able to get closer to bears because they were a little more used to people. Um, and in fact, that picture you see there was in somebody's yard. They let me pull my Jeep into the, their backyard. And you know, this was, we're talking like two years, two and a half years of no bears. And I have one month to my deadline and I'm panicking and I'm the woman who had invited me to come take pictures of bears in her yard, you know, they were avoiding me. I'd already been at her house for like three weeks and the bears weren't coming. Um, and this was somebody else's house. And he said, Oh, I get bears every day. Why don't you try my house? And my, like, you know, almost my first sighting was this couple having sex right out inside my window. And I was like, Whoa, okay. Um, and then, uh, a few months later, I was able to go back and actually take pictures of cubs. And this is in somebody's yard. Both all of these shots are in somebody's yard. So the hope for future in terms of wildlife and nature in Florida is really coexistence. Um, and I'm happy to report that there's already a whole lot of animals that are accommodating to the infrastructure that we have put into their world. And they are learning to deal with it and live there and thrive there. Um, and we can help make it even easier for them, just like we need that Florida wildlife corridor throughout the state, connecting all of the reserves. We need something like that within urban areas as well, which is why my husband and I did that gardening book that really kicked off this book. Um, if you look at the an average city uh, from the air, which is how a bird would do it, you can really appreciate the difference of between a yard that has no trees whatsoever, just lawn, versus the ones that even just have a couple of trees. And if you look at that from a ground level, think about what could happen if everybody put a little mini habitat on their um, in their yard or in their space, you know, and uh, you know, my book is is not addressing, I mean, the basic concepts of wildlife gardening are, are the same everywhere. Mine specifically for South Florida, and you guys are actually just out of it. Um, but the concepts are the same. Whatever the native plants to your area are, those are the, the plants that your animals, the wildlife really needs. Those are the things they know, they love, that provide them the nutrients they need, the places they need to live. And so if you use native plants, offer lots of different types of native plants, um, arrange them naturalistically, 
um, then you can have ecological processes happening within your yard and you can make those essential connections so that the wildlife can move freely between natural areas and within the city. Um, and there's a lot of other things you can do that I talk about in the book, but really, this is really the fundamental one. And even if all you have is a patio and room for a couple potted plants, if you put the right potted plants in there, it may make all the difference in the world to an endangered butterfly. So um, I wanted to also show all of these animals, and, and these are ones that I feature in the book, but all of these are ones that would probably be extinct or extirpated today if it weren't for people. People make a difference. They're making a difference and they can continue to make a difference. And we need that in order to continue having all of this beautiful diversity uh, that we have in Florida. And it's so special. There's nowhere else in the world that has this particular mix of wildlife. So it's important that we do help with this um, because there's a lot in Florida that is worth saving. It's a really beautiful place. Um, and yes, that even includes flamingos. It was forgotten for a time that they were native, um, but recent data and studies are showing that yes, you know, they Florida used to be part of their range um, during a, a period of overhunting. The Caribbean population collapsed and they stopped using Florida. But I think one of the most hopeful things for me working on this book was the fact that flamingos are coming back. Um, so that's a really nice positive note to end on. Um, thank you for having me. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. That was great. Thank you. And I, I know the Miami Book Fair is a bit far for you guys, but I will be up in Winter Park at the Mead Botanical Garden um, on January 9th. So if you want to join me live, it's being hosted by Writer's Block Bookstore. Um, and I would love to see people there. Great. Um, Great. While other questions are coming in, I'll just ask about the red wolf. Can you tell us anything about them in Florida? Yeah, so they've been trying to do a reintroduction of them. They have a breeding population um, that's being maintained at the Tallahassee Museum. Um, and in conjunction with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they've been trying to reintroduce them to St. Vincent Island off of the Panhandle. Um, and it was looking really good for a while. Uh, I think they got some, uh, had a few issues with hurricanes recently. Um, but I understand that they're still there. And so that that's a positive and they're, they're trying to keep it alive. And um, the unfortunate thing is there used to be a, a subspecies of the red wolf called the bl black wolf or the Florida wolf. And it only occurred in Florida and that version is extinct now. Um, but we do still have the red wolf and they're working very hard to try and at least reintroduce it to that one population there. Um, they're also trying to reintroduce it up further. I think it's in the Carolinas um, all, another part of its core habitat. Um, and, you know, they were really worried about the genetics because there had been this great bottleneck. Um, but recently they found what they're calling ghost, ghost populations uh, along the Texas coast, uh, which were actually mixed with coyotes, but they have some genetics that they didn't have in the red wolf population that they were breeding. And so they're, they're trying to um, bring that back in as well. Oh, um when you talk about the bottleneck, it reminded me of the bison. I, I saw the PBS show on the bison recently. That was heartbreaking. And, and yeah, and, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I'm looking forward to it. Because <laughs> we have the bison at Payne's Prairie and apparently used to have them in Florida. Susan, can you read the questions? Yeah, Delcy said that this information that you've given her is making you so happy, making her very happy to find out that we are coexisting more and more and how important it is to educate neighbors, friends, and family of the importance of coexisting, respect, and protect them. Very good. Absolutely. And I just have a question. What is your next, what do you want to challenge yourself to next? <laughs> um yeah this summer was crazy I was finishing up those two books that you see there um, and so I really haven't had a chance to think about what's next um but I um 
I've been contemplating a, a book that may or may not have photography in it, but um, I've been thinking about a book about confessions of an accidental birder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Birders love to read birder books. <laughs> right, Kathy? Yeah, that would be a good one. Here, I can stop my sharing so that you can see each other as well. Of course, in South Florida, what are your favorite plants for birds? Um, I, hmm, there's so many. <laughs> I think the ones that are most effective are things like um, buttonwood. And, and part of the reason I say buttonwood is because buttonwood is one that, that you can have in your yard um, and it can be big or it can be small, um, but it provides a lot for birds and insects um, as well. Um, I, I'm a fan of, you know, gumbo limbo is good, but that's big. Uh, the oaks are good. Stoppers are wonderful um, because you can make these hedges and they have fruit. Um, there's, yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Um, I think those are among my top in terms of from a being able to feed bird perspective. A lot of thanks for your ex extensive, important um, work. And thank you. thank you for joining us. Beautiful photos and a wonderful presentation. And Delcy wants to know, what is the beautiful animal on your background? That is a gray fox. Um, and it is the cover of the new book. Um, and the funny thing is where I live in Coconut Grove, there's actually a lot of gray foxes and I had been stalking them for months through my neighborhood and never saw one. Then I was in the Miami, historic Miami cemetery looking for a bird of all things. And that's where I found my gray fox. And he was way up high in an oak looking down at me and just sat there <laughs> and kept watching me. Um, turns out cemeteries are really good places for them. Apparently a lot of different cemeteries have their family of fox that lives there. Oh, that's very cool. Bird, it's good for birding too, of cemeteries. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, the gray foxes are supposed to be the only, um, member of the canine family that can climb trees. Oh, that's cool. I was wondering how it got up so high. It's like, yeah. oh. Yeah, and I regret it was so high and it was still pretty, They, they close, it closes pretty early so I couldn't have waited for better lighting, but it was really harsh lighting and he was really high in the tree so there was no way to get pictures of the tombstones and him in the same shot, but I would have loved to have done that. <laughs> awesome presentation. Thank you. A lot of compliments on your presentation. So, so I, have in a, I have a question. Oh, you got to oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what tips would you give to someone just starting out with nature photography? Just a few tips. I would definitely recommend starting somewhere where the animals are used to people. Um, so I know like, like a pop guy, a lot of those animals are, are quite used to having people around. Um, there's also, uh, you guys have the, uh, the, or what's this, the water treatment facility. That's also a park just outside of town. I'm forgetting the exact name of it. Places like that are amazing because there's so many birds concentrated in there and other wildlife. Um, and they're really used to people and you can get out on the boardwalk. You can get really close to them. So those are great places to get started because the wildlife is tolerant and they're patient. And even for people who really know their gear, you know, it's still, you're going to see, behaviors that would be very hard to get close to out other areas. Um, so those are really great places to get started and, and learn your gear and also start learning behaviors. Um, I think for me, one of the things I really rely on is, is my biology background and being able to read these animal behaviors. And so that helps me get the shots that I need and want. Um, and, and you can learn that as well by being in those areas where the animals are not being shy. They're behaving naturally, despite the fact that there's people everywhere. Thank you. What's your favorite South Florida park to photograph in? Do you have a favorite? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I love Wakota Hatchie wetlands and that's the water treatment facility in Palm Beach um, because it's really easy to, you know, you see they're, they're nesting right there. I mean, you can practically touch the birds and the chicks are there and 
Um, so it's a really exciting place and there's always something good happening there. Um, and in terms of, uh, of more, you know, natural areas, I really love Big Cypress Preserve. Um, I, you know, hadn't spent enough time there before I became the artist in residence, but once I did, I just appreciated it so much and the diversity of wildlife that you can get there because you're getting not just the wetland species, but more of the upland species as well. Um, things like panthers, for example, don't really like the water. They don't want to be in the Everglades. They'd rather be in the, the cypress domes and these higher areas. And so you have more opportunity to see a diversity of wildlife. And, and you know, those cypress trees at sunset, sunrise, they're just beautiful, stunning habitat. Wow. Lots of bromeliads and all, right? Yeah, oh yeah, lots of bromeliads. Yeah, it's just beautiful. And to even these, to get into one of those those domes, and um, I had the opportunity to go see ghost orchids in one of those domes uh, several years ago, and it was just, you know, you feel like you're walking into a sanctuary. <laughs> it's just really beautiful and calm and quiet, and but there's so much happening there. And then you have these gorgeous. Uh, the ghost orchid is just phenomenal when you see it in person. It's amazing. And the easy way to do that, of course, is to go to Corkscrew Sanctuary, <laughs> the Swamp Sanctuary. The boardwalk there is just phenomenal, and they've done a really good job of maintaining that habitat as well. And Debbie M. wants to know, when is the best time to visit Dry Tortugas? Definitely spring. So um, mid-April to mid-May is sort of the peak. Um, the the last two weeks of April and the first two weeks of, of May, I would say are probably the best. Um, you know, different species are really be coming through at different times. Um, but it's, it's a, it, it's, it can be a challenge to get out there. I had tried five times before we did our book and it wasn't until I got my book contract that I finally made it out there. Um, but it's an amazing place. And if you can try camping out there, because that's truly incredible. It's so quiet after the boat leaves and, um, and you have all of the city turns there, you know, they're already there at, at that time. So you've got the migrants, you've got the nesting, you can't see the boobies unless you take a boat, but you can see, you know, you, the, the city turns are there, the frigate birds are there. There's just so much going on. Very neat. Any more questions? So in January, you're going to be in Mead, January 9th, I believe it was. Yes, yes January 9th. So, so yeah, please help good time. spread the word and come, yeah. come meet me. <laughs> yeah, we that. yeah, it sounds like it would be great. Yeah, we'll try to get by. See ya. There's a question from Stephen Hall. Do you use long a long lens for most of your shots? So for the for this book, most of it was with a 100 to 400 lens. Um, I have since when I started working on the bird book, uh, because I needed identification images, I needed to be even closer. And a lot of those birds were quite wary. So I've now uh, added a 800 millimeter lens to my arsenal. And I tend to walk around with two cameras. Uh, I've moved into mirrorless. Um, and one of them is a 100 to 500 and the other one is an 800 millimeter mirrorless Canon. Um, and, and part of the incentive to move to mirrorless is because I, I tend to, I, based on my biology training, I tend to be a sneaker. I like to sneak my way close to animals as, as much as I can. And which is really hard to do with a tripod. And so, um, you know, to be able to handhold an 800 millimeter would be impossible if it wasn't mirrorless. <laughs> so you're carrying two cameras? I am carrying two cameras. Yep. Oh, <laughs> yeah. okay. That's a lot of work. Oh. Yeah. But I mean, the nice thing, you know, before I was working on the bird project, I, I, when I was working exclusively on the wild Florida project, I had one lens that was shorter for landscapes. So if I was in a situation where I wanted a landscape shot, I could do that. And then I had the longer telephoto ones. And then of course, when I started working on this like close up bird picture project, then I was 100 to 500 and 800 and no more landscape. 